So I'm going to be leaving for a little bit, everybody. Uh, but until then, Heather and Micah will keep you entertained. Enjoy. Hey, guys. So my name is Heather, and this is Micah, and we are Renegade Media Group. Just <laughs> us. Just us. There's no, there are no others. So today we're going to be watching Everything Wrong with Despicable Me in 19 minutes or less. And I've seen Despicable Me quite a bit, actually. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so I know this movie pretty well. I feel like this is going to be pretty controversial because it's like, I mean, you like this movie. so I love this movie. So we're going to go ahead and start because between us, we really don't have anything else to say on that, do we? No? I don't really have any funny anecdotes related to, you know, being an evil genius or having minions or what have you. I mean, we could argue that we're all Ben's minions. Is that how that works? I think so, because he's in my head a lot. I what don't. I. Oh. <laughs> I don't look good in he overalls. Said to stop telling people about his plans. All right. So let me just get this video popped up. All right. And we'll go ahead and start. And so begins the seemingly endless minion assault that we are destined to endure until the end of time. Has anyone who put the Great Pyramids of Giza in a film ever Googled where the pyramids actually are? Because, spoiler alert, they are semi-surrounded by large metropolitan cities called Giza and Cairo. Quick, honey, take my picture! American girls are fat and stupid and southern and fat fiction. Despite being ordered to stop by multiple authority figures, this asshole kid continues to asshole assholely. So if this pyramid never popped, no one would ever know that one of the Great Pyramids was missing, making the time spent to steal the pyramid completely useless. Isn't the whole point of stealing this giant monument to show people how powerful you are? Or to ask for a ransom to return it or something? That's if no true. one knows that it's gone, then what's the f I never really thought about it like that. This kid just bounced off it without puncturing it at all. And it's been there for a presumably long time. The Great Pyramid of Giza had been stolen and replaced by a giant inflatable replica. <laughs> the truck room. Nobody sees the inflatable pyramid go up was apparently done with a hand pump by one dude. There's panic throughout the globe as countries and citizens try to protect their beloved landmarks. Oh, no. Movie decides to depict two real monuments of other countries, but makes up a fake hillbilly monument for America. Yeah, this really shows what a flawed crew is in the beginning, but I'm more concerned that this kid is hanging out unsupervised in the middle of town while a grown man gives him a treat from his pocket. Crew just takes that cup of whatever from the barista when everyone knows how hyper-specific coffee orders are. So he'll regret not waiting in line and sipping his grande vanilla bean creme frappuccino served in a venti cup with almond milk, extra caramel drizzle, Sounds coconut good to me. flakes, Greek yogurt, protein well, powder, like and coconut. Splendor. I like the flavor, not the texture. Holy credits moment in the first five minutes. Even Suicide Squad held out till the middle of the movie. Ugh. This quiet residential road has three enormous lanes to accommodate his sight gun. Also, I guess since there are no real consequences for being a supervillain in this universe, Gru has no reason to be inconspicuous. One of Gru's many villainous deeds, violating his HOA agreement. <laughs> also, you know why supervillains usually live on a mountain or on an island? Serene seclusion, beautiful vistas, but mostly it's harder to get caught. But Gru lives in this planned community surrounded by other people and continues to live his day-to-day -day life without anyone questioning his profession. I see Ben doing that just to be a contrarian. Yeah. Parks it on the driveway instead. He keeps his treadmill in there. there. This door has its mail slot on the very bottom, which makes it a dick to mail people. Gru ah, has a video chat camera that accepts calls by itself, allowing Gru to be inevitably caught in an awkward situation in his living room. Yeah. Who is Gru talking to here? Is he asking Dr. Nefario to assemble them so they can be there before he gets to the lab? Because then he also tells the minions personally... Why the two orders, Gru? Why the two orders? Why does Gru need this hilariously complicated Rube Goldberg transportation device? Not because he's trying to keep it secret. It's the method we need a giant alligator couch. Fumbling group of mutants are somehow capable of building and maintaining this giant lab. Jesus, Gru's corporation has some excellent benefits. How has he not gone public yet? Even in the world of animated bull, this perspective is nonsensical. Gru lives in a heavily residential area with straight down in his entry tube for a matter of seconds. But movie wants me to believe he's hollowed out a fat cave-sized lair to house his evil doings. Please don't the Times Square Jumbotron! Um, where is the camera? Jumbotron is showing a direct perspective of Gru here, but there's no filming equipment in sight. We stole the Statue of Liberty, the small one from Las Vegas. 
Minions, many of which were presumably in on the heist to steal the smaller Statue of Liberty, are disappointed to learn what they should already know. They have short memories. Probably. The Statue of Liberty outside New York, New York, and Las Vegas is 15 fucking feet tall, but these minions almost come up to the top of the pedestal. My point is, this movie's size perfected. I haven't told you what it is yet. Premature rocket launch elation. Time to steal! Isn't this lab underground? Like, way the fuck underground? Also, when Gru got home... How do I ever think about that? <laughs> I don't really worry about it that much. Well, they're orphans. I love her. <laughs> oh! That's what Skyrim taught me. That's true. I understand that. First thing I did was kill that woman. Is this urinal read everyone's eye that uses it? Even if the door doesn't open unless you're a villain, I guess there will be a red laser shooting into your retinas while you pee. Gru reacts to the man sculptures on these columns like this is the first time he's seen them, even though earlier he says, I'm just getting not alone from the bank. They love me! Implying that he has been there many times before. Also, is there really a network of villains this large to support a bank that can support a facility like this? Or is there still a Lehman Brothers division of the Bank of Evil that's still up and running, partially funding this operation? Why does the receptionist need two computer screens, especially ones this far apart? Mom, someday I'm going to go to the moon. Oh. I'm afraid it's too late, son. NASA isn't sending the monkeys anymore. Damn, Gru's mom is savage. I'm surprised he's just an innocuous supervillain that steals large, insured objects and not a mass murderer. I'd like to see this shrink ray. The director said, let's have your bank loan officer character eat an apple in this scene. It'll make him look like an even bigger bank loan officer. You don't have it. And yet you have the audacity to ask the bank for money. Gotta side with the asshole bank guy here. Why the hell wouldn't Gru steal the shrink ray before applying to the loan? Do you have any idea of the capital that this bank has invested in? We're far too few of your sinister plots actually turning a profit. Let's talk about that for a second. Based on what we've seen so far, it doesn't appear that any of these villains are holding the items they steal for ransom, nor do they have any intention of selling them on some international monument black market. So how the fuck are the villains or the evil bank making any of their money back? Are they licensing these stories? It's a good question. To make weird half-baked animated films out of? Gru's secret plane is probably the worst secret plane to ever secret, considering the massive line of black smoke coming out its back end. The scientists just happen to be testing out their super secret drink ray right before Gru and his crew make it to the facility. Also, why are these guys so scared and relieved by this test. Haven't they done this before? Shrink race technology has been around for long enough for Gru to hear about it, and they plan to steal it. So they should have done many of these trials. Gru somehow knows the exact location of this shrink ray, and is able to drill through the ceiling, grab it, and escape with absolutely no difficulty at all. Almost as if the movie wanted to push through this part so it can spend its energy on the montage of Gru and the three little girls at the amusement park. It's worth it. It's a fun montage. With him on this highly perilous trip overseas. I mean, sure, they got the shrink ray without a problem, but maybe a well-trained whore could ensure they kept it for more than 30 seconds. No, 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 Gru continues to fly perfectly straight while his prized possession is stolen in front of him. Gru releases all of his bombs and missiles at once instead of conserving them as the fight continues. And even if they were effective, he'd have destroyed the fucking shrink ray. Vector's playing the Wii, but there's no motion sensor bar on this TV. And the point of was to get the players standing up instead of sitting on the couch eating fucking potato chips. So Vector's doing this Wii all wrong. Gru, who is also supposed to be a world-class supervillain, is seemingly unable to anticipate the security measures Vector may have on his property. Gru survives this and this. Look, are we just gonna go full Wiley Coyote here? Because I'm already suspending my disbelief so hard my back is hurting. How big is this town anyway? Not only are the two most wanted international villains located within what looks like a mile from each other, the fucking orphanage is nearby. I see you have been given the Medal of Honor. Miss Hattie sees these things appear in real time on her screen, but apparently just learned how to use a computer, so it doesn't surprise her. Can we proceed with this adoption? Please tell Marco, Edith, and Agnes to come to the lobby. Wait, how did Drew know what the girls' names were to even get on the adoption list? Be adopting any of these girls. Booyah! The scene is further proof that this may be the worst villain who has ever existed. Instead of using his new shrinking power to roll out a rain of villainous behavior, or shrinking that giant pyramid he obviously has, Vector inconveniences himself by shrinking the appliances in his bathroom. And we gotta talk to Grandpa, okay? I thought this would be more like Yannon. Eh, oh. It kinda is. Aside from the large weaponry that's being obviously displayed, the story's pretty similar. The wealthy bachelor adopts a girl from an abusive orphanage for selfish reasons, doesn't like her, then warms over time. The only thing that's missing is yet another cover of Hard Knock Life. I guess I need to see Annie, too. Well, I suppose the plan you work with, too. Sure, but, you know, but, but does his villainy typically involve child murder? He's incredibly casual about this. 
Ruby continues to be a big old fucking cheat when it comes to perspective, considering those spikes were way too long to miss impaling Edith. I've always noticed that. <laughs> why is Groove really keeping up this subterfuge even for a night? All he needs to for is to get into Vector's mansion, so why not go there as soon as they're adopted? What about the air? This kind of backdrop would easily put Margot in the hopes of shame back at the orphanage. And since this sassy retort gets basically no reaction from Groove, I would submit that Miss Hattie is more evil than either Groove or Vector. Huh? I will see you in six. Okay. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Why does she even need to reassure them? I know they'd probably prefer a loving household, but all three of them were adopted at the same time, and they're basically free now. I'm convinced that at least 72% of Minion Numer is ass biz. What are these? Adopted Boogie Robots! I know this is a comical misunderstanding, but why did Dr. Nefario give all the Boogie Robots tiny Boogie Boobs? Master Villain Groove. That is a good question. Detail of his heist is leave three complete strangers unsecured to run amok in his house. Yeah, he's moved to the child or anything, but come the hell on. That is cool! Earlier, Didn't Groove he leave the minions to watch him? Now the door stays open I don't remember. I'm sure they got distracted with something. Oh, yeah. As much as a fully grown group. I meant to close that. But they're in a severely underground fucking bunker. And now the minion is floating away into the nice neighborhood. So nobody's gonna notice them. Does anything mean anything in this fucking universe? What I really want to know was this. Now those are cookie robots! This is the only thing that Groove's asked Nefario to work on. He led this presentation with an anti-gravity juice and a silly fart gun. In real life, I am a spy. And it is top secret. Groove openly shoots people in crowded venues with a freeze ray and intimidatingly drives his enormous vehicle in regular traffic. That should be enough to call attention to the fact that he's a villain. But he also has fucking newspaper clippings on the wall that tell everyone he's the best villain. So why the silly cover story here? What are those? They are my... Okay, so if the kids buy that a mutant Y pastel butt plug is an actual human, I guess anything goes in this movie. And I am completely uninterested in the stakes of the leads. Jeez, these minions are assholes. There's a perfectly good spot that you could even pull through right next to the handicapped spot. Uh. Minions go all the way to a Costco-like store just to get a toy, which means they'll definitely come back with a five-pack of toy unicorns, three jugs of milk, a flat screen, and a rack of ribs. 49 seconds of pure, uncut minionation. Hope you appreciated it when it was only that long. You're never, You're never gonna be my dad. What the hell? I mean, I know Margot's got some things to work out for being an orphan, but after a rocky start, Gru hasn't been that bad. He didn't get too pissed when they broke into the lab, he tried to replace Agnes's toy immediately, let them have a teepee party, then provided a warm bed for each of them. He may want to pump the brakes on this whole angst thing until after he steals the fucking moon. It's beautiful. These little bastards couldn't recognize a suitable stuffed animal in what was essentially Walmart, but were able to dress a toilet bowl brush to look like a toy. First, we're going to dance class. We have a big recital coming up. Come on, man. These are fucking orphans. Don't they have a dance class they regularly attend? They were doing hard sales labor for their evil headmistress, so she ponied up a dance class for all three of them? You're going to suffer the wrath of Gru! Seriously, I'm going to count to three. Steve Carell's accent was briefly hijacked by Hans and Franz for this scene. Gru shows up at this highly secretive mission of Vector's place in his highly conspicuous Groomobile. Name one person who ordered more cookies than me. That'll be $52. Holy f***, Vector ordered 23 boxes. So even though these aren't technically Girl Scout cookies, that's $2.25 a box and is a fantastic deal. Not only are these sentient cookie robots able to track down the location of the shrink ray in a matter of seconds, they're able to hack into an evil genius' secret vault and security system with zero difficulty. Also, the keypad that opens this safe is also capable of shutting down the entire security system because Vector's security system is working together with a screenwriter to create a situation that is most convenient to the plot. These cookies were also paid off by the screenwriter to seal Gru in Vector's fortress for his escape to be more hijinxy. Protagonist approaches antagonist, scene then cuts to a single shot of antagonist looking in protagonist's direction, cuts back to where protagonist was, and he there got gotcha. Vector conveniently has a ventilation system that has plenty of room for a man and his minions to properly die hard. It's just like in Die Hard. But also unnecessary, because there's a shiny glowy thing that could light your way right behind you. Casual vehicular homicide is casual. Also, this really does serve the dude right. Who the fuck would fish off a guardrail on a steep curve of a busy-ass highway? He looked at the <laughs> maybe he was hoping. Wow. Too bad he used his real name when he adopted the girls, right? If he'd used a fake name, he probably could have abandoned them easily without them showing up right back at his doorstep. Overreaction revenge shot would have definitely disintegrated the stuffed unicorn that was being coveted. Despite how annoying she can be, Agnes is freaking adorable. And for this moment alone, I'm having a grew like rush of affection. Quick, take one set off before she does something else obnoxious. That is awesome. You blew up the whole thing! With no legal or societal consequences, this place is anarchy. Woohoo, motherfucker! 
We have 12 days until the moon is in optimum position. Movie that's played way past the moose with physics, perspective, laws, biology, humanity, decides to throw in some bold sciencey stuff to create an arbitrary deadline. We can't afford any distractions! What's up to Fario's ass all of a sudden? He's the one that's been dicking around with the boob robots and fart guns, and all of a sudden there's a sense of urgency? You don't seem terribly focused, Crew. Why is Perkins even keeping up this appearance in the meeting? Shouldn't he be getting the location of the shrink ray and telling Vector about it immediately? What's the benefit of keeping him on the line? What is he? So, is he keeping his identity a secret or not? These kids just walk in every time Drew is talking about villainy, so pick a side, baby. The ever-flexible size of this underground bunker that's directly under a regular neighborhood can now hold a functional rocket ship, because the movie don't give a fuck about what you think you previously saw. Like the movie will clobber you over the head to remind you that Drew's a psychopath, even though now that he's listened to a Pharrell song, he's completely harmless. Hey, Dad. What the hell does it matter that Perkins is Vector's father? The only advantage this gives Vector is awareness that Drew stole the shrink ray and apparently an endless supply of apples. This is a screenshot of a moment that never happened in their previous video chat. During that chat, the only person who was ever present with the shrink ray was Drew, and the only girl who ever got in the way of the camera was Eva. Do you have any idea how lucrative this moon heist could be? Actually, no, because Movie hasn't explained any motive for capturing it, other than being considered the best villain alive. So just wait till Drew sees my latest weapon. Swindler! Oh yeah! Can someone explain to me how this jackass was able to steal one of the pyramids with only weapons that launch sea creatures? Oh, I don't like that. Squids are pretty intelligent. This is going on forever. Late Movie Groove would be excellent at cinema sins. Hang on, if his last name is Groove, then why does Groove go by Groove? His first name is apparently Thelonious, but that's definitely not what it says here. Groove! You and I have been working on this for years. Your chance to make history. They've been working on this for years. Groove just went to ask the bank for a loan after Nefario told them they didn't have enough money. Then he steals the ray and builds the rocket within 12 days. So why did this take years? I'm here for the girl. I was saved to call that she wanted to return with me. And in this universe, we treat children like that juicer you ordered on Amazon when you were drunk that time. Goodbye, Mr. Groove. Thanks for everything. Protagonist begins movie as a cold-hearted bastard that lives a life of crime, then is forced into circumstances where he needs to care for another individual, but then the business of his previous life makes it impossible to care for that individual and they hate him for it before inevitably reconciling cliché. Not only is this apparently the first indication the neighborhood has had that there's a secret underground lair, but given the amount of rocket fire, Gru has definitely killed everyone in a 10-block radius. Oh yeah! This character is definitely Discount Syndrome, made even more annoying by giving him a stupid-ass catchphrase or two. Sure, minions can survive the cold vacuum of space, because they'll do whatever it takes for a cheap joke. We're clearly I forgot about him. ...a screener of the movie, because there's no way that the video feed they are getting him through. Yeah, something like this would happen if the moon went away, but several other more devastating things might happen also. The Earth would start to faster, make the day shorter, and the axis may dramatically tilt, causing extreme weather conditions. I could go on, but just know it'd be bad. But instead of Gru threatening to do this, showing how much he could do it, demanding money, so he doesn't do it, he decides to steal the moon, ask for no money, watch Earth fall apart while everyone wonders who stole the moon. I guess Gru's only driving factor is to prove to himself and his mother that he can steal very big things, and he doesn't care if Earth gets trolled in the process. We have to warn him! And Har har, this is a stupid gag. But I'm also annoyed by how this character was just a cold-hearted asshole when the kids were around, but is a comic relief any other time in the movie. I know this is an animated movie with very few, if any, physical laws, but it's still ridiculous that Gru is slamming on brakes, or yanking on the controls, when this is now literally a hunk of metal sliding down the street with no braking mechanism aside from a fucking parachute. Oh, this makes him feel better. A shrunken moon-sized receptacle on the outside of his border wall. Missiles are clearly shown as being dangerous, but the first time Gru was here, he took on many more and survived. So why do we care now? Damn, Gru's gone back and forth to space with some close proximity to a missile and it's now back up in the atmosphere. Gonna need to pop his ears something fierce after this shit's over. Nefario ex machina. Also, how did Dr. Nefario and the minions know that Gru would be coming to Vector's lair? He only knew about the shrink ray's effects wearing off. He was just trying to warn Gru and should have no knowledge about the kids or Vector. Moon decides to pause its enlargement for several minutes after this point for dramatic effect. You're going to have to jump! Jump? Are you insane? Yeah, but nothing bad ever happens to anyone in this movie regardless of what they do, so fuck it. So fast. I gotta hand it to Vector. He's great at being an asshole villain. Much better than Groot. But I never wanted to punch an animated character in the face for <laughs> my entire life. All these assholes were able to make a minion chain faster than gravity could pull Groot and Margot to the ground, allowing them to be caught right at the last second.
of the moon, which has still not increased size since its growth spurt three minutes ago, smartly tries to check its way out of his mood. Also, why is there a giant red button that's sole purpose is to make the escape pod go straight up? God damn it, Lee, I want you to science. And once again, law enforcement is baffled. There's law enforcement in this movie? Okay, go on, <laughs> Barely not. The orphanage let Gru re-adopt these girls. Not only did he give them back a couple days ago, he directly influenced their kidnapping from the recital. They turned out to be a great heaven. To be fair, he's only been a parent for a few weeks at the most. Let's not cash that sentiment in just yet. Oh good, the moon is back in the sky. And now it's a super close Bruce Almighty supermoon, and we're all gonna die when it gets sucked into our gravitational pull. You the beach? Many minutes of maddening moronic minionage. And we are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there. And that product is called iPod. We've been working on this for a while. It's busy lifting thing. Fill you with gas, and the gas is so terrifically lifting that it lifts you right off the ground like a balloon. Willy Wonka. And the butt ball? What's a butt ball? For a poop in the city. You say that and I have to grunt because I know him. Look, is look, Wayne Brady going to have to choke a bitch? <laughs> oh, wow. It has been disintegrated. And brother, when it disintegrates, it disintegrates. You mean shrinkage. Significant shrinkage. Wow. That's another classic is Willy Wonka. A yeah. fizzy lifting drink. I've seen that one. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know where to start with this. So, Ooh, I mean, most actor I hate. I I hated him through the whole. I movie. mean, he's supposed to be a total he's jerk. Annoying. Yeah. I hate his face. It's not. Wow. That's it. I just he's don't just don't like born his with face. it, poor guy. Not anything else he does, just his face. I mean, I don't like him in general, but his face. I I do like these like sea creature themed weapons. <clears throat> Those are cool. I'll admit that. I would like a squid gun. What would you do with it? I'd shoot squids at people. Why? I mean, not nice people, just people okay. that were bad people. I mean, squids are pretty smart. Like, they might be able to, like... Someone skips a line know, at Walmart. Unlock and just, doors like, or something. Squid at them. I mean, they can probably do stuff. Like, unlock doors and, like, you know... Might be good, like, you know, proofreaders. Turn mm-hmm. off the light switch when you're already in bed and comfortable at night. Right, instead of Bluetooth, just like shoot a squid out over there. You have a Bluetooth light switch? No, but that's the thing now. But okay. you could just get a squid gun, so yeah, whatever. I mean, why would you want to get a Bluetooth light switch when you could get a squid gun? Yeah. I mean, I get the point of the video, but I also feel like he's a little harsh for an animated video. Yeah, most, most of it's just, <laughs> just to be ridiculous and over the top, because it's like, okay. it's a cartoon. Like, no, I mean, it's nobody's that not, upset it, about it, this it, stuff. It's not going to make sense. I mean, it's like... I didn't think about half of that stuff. The spikes did bother me. I thought the spikes were too big for... Well, I mean, it's like, nobody gets mad when, like, you know, an anvil gets dropped on Wile E. Coyote, because he, he comes back. Yeah. I mean... I mean, it was it was inter- like there were a lot of good points though, like I the mean, underground layer. Yeah, was... some well, I mean, you know, I think that's part of like that's part of the joke. It's like, yeah, he's like in homeowners association out in front of God and everybody, but yeah, has like you know, I guess miles I really of tunnels under there. That like the back of the house was like an expansion of the lab, is what I always assumed. I mean, you know, it's like he just zips away somewhere. I mean, it could be like miles away in some you know thing. Uh, well, no, because the rocket actually comes up through the house, so part of it has to be at least underground. Well, maybe only some of it's underground. I mean, that stuff doesn't really bother me. It's like it's supposed—it's supposed to be ridiculous. It's despicable me. <laughs> and I mean, it's super fun. I mean, like it's a good movie. You know, I don't really. It's a real good movie. The I didn't. Well, the first time I saw it, I didn't think the minions were like too overbearing. I mean, I thought they were pretty funny, but I didn't really like. In there. I didn't really like the Minion movie. It was just, like, too much. I haven't seen it. I really dislike Minions. As much as I love Despicable Me, Minions got ruined for me. Poor little guys. My six-year-old hates Minions. Oh. Like, she's she's good. She she thinks they're dumb. <laughs> I mean, they are kind of ridiculous, but I felt, felt like that was the point. Yeah. 
also um if you guys want to see more videos of just me and Micah and no one else, <laughs> because we are in a good media group. We s we s took over the house. We stole everything. Yes. I moved in. This was my secret plan the whole time. The whole time. So well, you can hit subscribe below to see more videos from us. And I guess there are some other guys on here sometimes. Sometimes. And also, uh, we have a Patreon. That's real cool. We have a Discord with over 2,000 members. Tons of people there willing to talk to you and help you. That's a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people on our Discord now. And we have a great community. It's all, like, geared towards, you know, like, making Fan friends. Fan fiction. And also, no. Oh. Making friends and also, you know, like, if you need help, there's, like, a special channel there. It's real cool. So definitely check out the Discord. I have a channel below. Um, I have, you know, these guys on it all the time. And we're going to be doing some really cool projects that are going to be half on Renegade Media Group and half on mine. That's all I can tell you for now. There's your second hint. If you haven't caught the first one, you'll have to go watch some reactions. So until next time, I'm Heather. I'm Micah. And bye.